Stompin' Tom Connors always kept a brand new Chevy Suburban truck. That was his his vehicle of choice when he, you know, made it into money. That's what he drove, and uh, he started driving them in the in the eighties, I think, and that's what he always had. He was a big GM fan, and uh, when we started this tour, he had this brand new black Chevy Suburban. It looked like something out of, you know, CSI or whatever the hell. And I, the first day, you know, after we had that initial meeting in the motel room, I, I got up in the morning and we were, you know, flopping around trying to get ready for whatever. And I looked at Tom, I said, that's a hell of a nice truck. And he goes, yeah, it is. I like, I like it. He said, except I don't care much for the governor. And I was, and I was, I kind of stopped for a second. I was like, Governor, what do you mean? He said, well, the speedometer goes to 210 or 220. He said, but it's got a governor. Won't let you, won't let you go any faster than 140. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, he said, yeah, what what the hell's up with that? He said, what if you're going, what if you're on the highway and you're going 140 and you want to pass somebody? <laughs> To which I thought to myself, well, I don't know, buy a, a, a plane? That first night uh, that we played in Brockville was fantastic. Like we, it, the the music on the show, like the actual show itself, was always the easiest thing. It was it was simple. We all it, it just sort of gelled. Even though you know we had there was, it was a little rough around the edges because because me and Dave had never played with Darren and Charlie before. And, but they were, you know, they were they were stout musicians. They they could they could cut it, and and they they had that kind of that Tom finesse, you know. It was it was it was a ragged, it was ragged around the edges, but it was well done. You know what I mean? Like and that's, and that was Tom's sound, and that's what he loved, and that's so we delivered on that. No no questions asked. So the shows were going fantastic, and. And uh, we got good reviews right out of the gate. Tom always got good reviews. How, who's not going to like a Stompin' Tom show, right? So remember one of the first things that happened not long after we started was we ended up playing, uh, I can't remember if it was Canada Day or or what it was exactly, but it, we were playing at Rideau Hall for the Governor General, Adrian I believe it was Adrian Clarkson at the time, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, he was just a major hero to me and all of us. And uh, something happened that was, you know, again profound and and a massive learning thing for everybody involved around Tom, and a, an example of how Tom always fought for Canadian talent. He, he, he didn't just do these things like returning his Junos and walking out of the music industry in protest over, you know, Canadians not being supported on radio and also having to move to the States or choosing to move to the States and 
you know, making their living down there and coming home and collecting Juno Awards, you know, which which is our Grammy. It's our thing. It's it's our Grammy Award, right? And uh, he he didn't. It, it wasn't it wasn't a, a a publicity stunt. You know what I mean? He really was that way. He rabidly supported Canadian talent, and he held people in the industry in this country's feet to the fire when they didn't do the right thing. And I was about to witness this, you know, firsthand, and it was quite... He he sort of tried to hide it. He didn't want to make a like a big public thing between all of us. But at the last moment, he sort of divulged what was going on, and this and this is what was happening. So here was the issue, and I, uh, you know, at this point in my career, like back in the back in the eighties and and early nineties, right when I was in and out of Canada all the time. Uh, when I was in Canada, I was hugely supported by the CBC. Now, mind you, it wasn't the CBC National. I never really got any any kind of traction from CBC National whatsoever. But the but our local C, branch of the CBC in Halifax, you know, Glenn Meisner, Carl Falkenham, you know, Atlantic Airways, all these different shows that they put on, and I've talked about that at length in the early part of this biography. These people, you know, paid my bills a lot of the times when I was flat broke, you know, with no name to speak of, and I just, I, I had a, I had a, a, a strange sense of loyalty to the CBC, and it was really odd that I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm in 2003, and still not really aware of the, the political face of CBC, right, and when I say po- political, I don't mean government, I mean the way that they operate, which I found out during this altercation, is a bit unfair, right? So what happened was we were t- we were going to go play this huge celebration at Rideau Hall, this massive outdoor concert. Uh, there was a crap ton of... It was the who's who of famous Canadian talent on this show, right? Uh, Lightfoot was on it. We were on it. Um, and there were, I don't remember who else was on the show, but it, there were some huge names performing on this event. So here's the bottom line. The CBC is uh, federally funded. And I mean funded, like billions of dollars. Uh, so it has a mandate to be nearly 100% Canadian. And so CBC Television, however, is is also obviously part of that branch. But it's but they sell advertisements on CBC Television. You know, ads are sold on that on that network. So you know, there's there's something going on. There's commerce going on there somewhere, obviously. And they're they're rich. They I mean the corp is rich. It has a it has a, a bottomless pit of money to do whatever they want to do, really. And uh, so the CBC was planning on filming this performance and airing it on television. So, but they were, they came to every artist and said, we're just, we're only paying a union scale. (laughs) So that means that they were going to get Stomp and Tom in a live performance for $300. And they were going to get Gordon Lightfoot for $300. And each of the bandmates, the band members, were going to get paid whatever, $260 or whatever it was. So, you know, at the time, it seemed normal to me, and I thought, okay, well... Right, so this, the corp only pays union scale. We all know that. So what's going on? And Tom lost it. He was like, "Wait a second. He's like, these people have millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, 
they're going to film us performing and sell advertisements on the show. The government's footing the bill. And they're, they're going to get me and Lightfoot and all these other acts for no money. And all of a sudden it clicked in. It was like, yeah, what's what the hell? Like, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. They're supposed to be supporting Canadian talent, but yet they want to put dozens of musicians on stage for nothing. You know, $150, $200 a man and time and a half for the leader. That's ridiculous. They're making millions off of this through adver through commercials on television. What the hell? And it suddenly just clicked. I just suddenly clued in. It clicked in on me. I was like, okay, I get it. And Tom went on the warpath. Tom went to Brian and said, I'm not doing this show. They're not filming us. You know, we're getting paid to do the show by, by you know, we're getting paid to do the show. Well, actually, I don't even know how that even worked. Uh, I think he was doing it as a favor to Adrian Clarkson, if you want the truth of it. We're getting paid to do the show, this stupid scale. So they're not filming us for that. If they want to film me, it's $50,000. That's what he charged to do a live show. And it's worth every penny of it. And could generate it with ticket sales and whatnot at, at a venue. It wasn't like he was asking people to just shit 50 grand. He could sell that many tickets. So his guarantee was $50,000. And God knows what Lightfoot's was. You know, Lightfoot is commands a massive ticket price. And he, especially back then in 2003, he was kicking ass. He was almost on a sort of a comeback. And uh, so the next thing you know, Tom's on the phone with Lightfoot. They know each other very, very well. They're old, old friends. And Tom, I, I was actually... Uh, Tom told me later about this phone call to Lightfoot. And he said, he just, he said, he called Gordy and he said, listen, I don't think this is fair. He said, and he said also, he said, he said, actually, I, I know it's not fair. Why are these people allowed to put us on television and make money off advertising and raise this viewership of their, of their network by God knows what and not pay us what we usually get for doing this type of performance. And he says to Lightfoot, he said, if you would stand with me, if you join me and demand that we get paid what we're worth, uh, we might be able to make a big change here. The CBC might have to start, you know, paying people what they get normally for performing in front of thousands of people. And in this case, on television, millions of people, right? And the, it was a long conversation. It went back and forth for quite a while, apparently. And, and Lightfoot just wouldn't do it. Because Lightfoot is not, not a confrontational person, Lightfoot. It, and, it's, and, and he loves Tom. I knew he loved Tom. But he, he, just, he basically told Tom, he said, you know, I just, I, I, it is what it is. I accept it. I'm going there. But, you know, I'm invited to go there. We're going to go do it. I don't want it to get into some kind. I don't want to get into some kind of huge fight with the federal government, you know. And I just can't. I can't back you, right? I, I, it's not worth my. It's not worth the amount of trouble and backlash. I'm just. I want to keep my head down. And he, and he was smart to do that, right? I think. But Tom, of course, Tom, you expected Tom to do to do it, right? So. Um, so we so we get to Rideau Hall and it was quite something. It was, I mean, we were taken in there by federal employees in vans that weren't our own and all these different things. Like they allowed Tom to go in, but they wouldn't let anybody else go in. We had to be carried in by by security and uh, taken to this back this backstage area that had a tent and a and a and a, a craft table and all this different stuff and. I think I mentioned meeting Lightfoot there for the first time. That's when I first met him. And uh, Dave met him the first time there, and his, his meeting with Lightfoot was much more humorous than mine. Uh, 
we we followed Lightfoot, who was on there by himself. He played alone, and that's that's an interesting point because that's how we got around, you know, the the sh of getting shortchanged by the court. He didn't take his band. He went by himself and played the guitar and sang. He didn't bring his band. He wasn't on tour in the area. So it he mitigated his financial loss that way. Right? He didn't he didn't ask his band to take the hit. He just went out and he played his four hundred dollar set of tunes and got and got his his federal C B C check and that was it, right? But so we followed Lightfoot and as he was coming off. We were going on, and Dave had a. Uh, we didn't have time to set up the upright bass because it was a, basically a plug and play show. Uh, Dave's coming through the curtain with his electric bass, and he doesn't know what's on the other side. He's coming through the curtain, and he hit Lightfoot right in the guts <laughs> with the head of his bass. And all, all you heard was oof. And Dave pulled the curtain back, and there's Lightfoot. And he goes, oh, my God, Mr. Lightfoot. I, and that's how Dave met, met Gordon, right? So we went out on stage, and Tom told Brian, he said, I, I don't want to see one goddamn camera out there with a light on it. You know, and, and they did. Look, our team went out and literally went to each camera and made sure that the and talked to the cameraman and said... Make sure that this camera is off and pointed to the ground. That is, and that's what they did. And we went out with full band and, and just tore it up. And and I don't know what they did in the... I'm not even sure, I don't even remember if it was live or what it was. I can't remember. But it seems like they... It may have been live and they had to go to something else while we were playing... So they had they had multiple feeds. I'm pretty sure it was for Canada Day. I'm, I'd have to ask Gunning, but anyhow. So that's so that was that. Like we we went in. We wouldn't let them film us, and I always admired Tom for that. You know, Tom was in the same boat as the rest of us. There was a point in time where the CBC was the only game in town for Canadian musicians, and they and they. They did a lot for for Canadian talent, like the, no question that they the, they had the Don Messer show, they had the the Sing Along Jubilee, they had they had. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if Tommy Hunter was on CBC. I think that might have been CTV, which was a commercial network. But anyhow, it was obvious that the CBC had done a lot for for Canadian talent, but you know. There comes a time when it's like, yeah, you you can't just keep. There's a there's a great line, and I think I've used it before, right? Exposure, okay, is not a publicity technique. It's a fucking uh, disease. It's. It's a physical condition that can cause death. That's what exposure is, right? And at a certain point, exposure is just a way, in my opinion, of all kinds of different entities to get musicians to play for nothing. That's, and it's not fair. It's not fair, right? It's not fair that, that, you're able to use some perceived benefit that you offer someone that has no real monetary value. It's, it's, it's ambiguous at best what exposure of any kind really does for you, right? And at a certain point, it's valueless because you already have exposure. You, you've already you've already got a career established, you've already got a following, you've already paid your dues. And for somebody, for something as large as the CBC to look at Stomp and Tom and go, 
well, we're not paying you any more than scale because we expose you to blah, blah, blah. He'd already been exposed. Lightfoot had been exposed. God knows who else was on that show. Huge names. I don't remember who they were, but I remember thinking, this is like, this is one of the wickedest lineups I've ever seen. And they're all on there for Union Scale. And that's just not fair. And uh, so I had to I had to commend Tom for that one. Absolutely. And uh, again, you know, things I saw him do where I where I thought, you know, he's dead on the money on this one. This this is definitely the way that you should, you know, this is how you should look at these things. You can't just let keep people keep taking advantage of you, no matter what the arena. So the next thing I one of the next things I discovered on the tour was that my best friend Dave was uh, an activist. <laughs> I had no idea. I really didn't. I'd spent, you know, years with this guy. Like, I I, I met him in 94. I, we'd been friends for nearly 10 years. And was with him all the time. And, and was playing and recording. And had spent days and days and days cooped up together in vehicles and studios. And I never knew the man was an activist. And, I, and, and it... He doesn't like to be called that, but he he is. He's he's a champion of the underdog, and 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 it's so. The first time I seen this demonstrated, we were in a hotel room one night, and 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 he got a call from home, and there was a news article about. So Dave lives in Picto. He he lived in in Picto proper at that point, I believe. And Picto is the the birthplace of New Scotland. It's where the Hector arrived. And it's an ancient town, and it's a beautiful town, and it's marred by at that time was marred by only one thing, and it was this horrible uh paper mill that was across the harbor from the town that just made going there to Picto incredibly unpleasant because it wasn't just the smell, it was the physical effects of of being in that plume when it was down on the ground and coming across the water and you, like as soon as it hit you, you started breathing that shit. It was just like instant headache, nausea, uh, tremors in your hands. My lips used to go numb. It was, it was just a, it was a shithole when that, when that smoke was coming across and it was yellow. It was disgusting. And, uh, at that time we weren't really, you know, that aware of just how bad it was. I wasn't of, of how, bad it was or that there was any kind of movement to to get it sorted out but that's another story altogether so there was that problem that he was dealing with his whole life as he lived in that place his whole life and so he gets this call that there's a news story on tv and it's about there's these uh there's a causeway that goes across the, the harbor to picto and on the side of this causeway is ancient old weirs that used to be there for whatever reason. And so there's a, a, a large number of these giant kind of telephone pole style, you know, weir legging sticking up out of the water. And every year, cormorants, these seabirds come and nest on top of these poles. And they, and they, now cormorants are, are beautiful birds, but they, they have a very acidic uh, guano, right? Like they, their their feces is just like acid, and uh, they poop all over everything and burn everything all to shit. And and sometimes by certain sex, I guess sects of the sections, if you will, of the of the population consider them a, consider them a nuisance. And. Uh, for, I don't even know why the hell they were doing this, but for some reason, uh, the provincial, it was a government, as far as I know, 
uh, maybe the Department of Lands and Forests, I don't know, they were going out in boats to these all these poles, dozens of them, that were had cormorant nests on them, and they were taking a fire, like a, a water cannon, powered out of the water in the harbor, taking a water cannon and blowing these birds off these things and their nests to, to try to keep them from from nesting there. And, of course, the birds were confused and terrified, and then the poor bastards would just start rebuilding their nest. As soon as they were knocked off, they were like, oh, shit. And, I, I mean, it was sad. It was sad. It was a, a stupid thing to do. I don't even know why they were doing it, but they had some reason. Well, Dave saw this and heard about it, and, and he he lost his mind. He was... And he became obsessed with these birds. <laughs> and it, I don't mean to laugh because he was dead on the money. He, he he had every right and every, as a human being, to to go, wait a second, what the hell are you guys doing, right? And so he, he basically went on sort of a campaign to save these birds from this, what was really torture it was not nice what they were doing to them and uh so that took up days and, and it got to be where i was just making fun of him all, all the time <laughs> and he in his inimitable way you know he, he he'd get mad you know oh jeez you know, this and then he'd he'd go into a big and he's well read dave and well studied he he doesn't just say shit off the top of his head. He does massive amounts of research, knows the history of the issue. And so, like, he would he would go into these huge monologues with me about why, you know, you shouldn't do this. And, I, I mean, it's, I wasn't arguing that, but it was just so funny to me to see him go off on this tangent about these birds because I didn't know that about him. I, and, and, and it made me love him even more. But I also was surprised, and it was a source of humor to me, because I, he was really getting upset. <laughs> and pretty soon, it was taking up so much of his mental space that everybody, we all started talking about this, right? So there was a lot of ribbing and going, like, and even Tom, I think, got in on making fun of him about these these cormorant birds, right? Uh, cormorants, they're called. And this, so anyhow, they... So that was interesting. And, would, of course, as time went on, I would learn even more about just how dedicated Dave was to the environment and the ecology and his fellow man. And, uh, you know, raised him into hero status for me. He uh, 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 you know, even though the man's my my best, the best friend I've ever had in my entire life, he, I just have so much respect for that guy because of some of the things I've witnessed, and that, and this thing with the birds was the beginning of it. But it really was, it was funny at first. You know, well, actually, it it just remained kind of funny because it was so unlike anything I'd ever seen him do, and he was so passionate about it. He'd get frustrated with me when I was laughing at him. That made it even funnier. But he did eventually, I'm not sure if he actually helped to solve that problem. Chances are he did. I don't know. I, I can't remember how it turned out. But they actually they actually decided to stop doing what they were doing. I think they eventually left the birds alone, which was good. So one of the next things, I mean, there's lots of things that happened. But uh, a couple of really good stories that were just out of control was we were traveling east to west going down into uh, the Mississauga area for a show at the uh, it was the, the Hershey Theater or it was one of the big theaters down there and Tom decided now Tom leads these this caravan of there's four or five vehicles you know behind him or, or actually and actually maybe three or four it was us and the other band, the rest of the, yeah, both three or four vehicles. Anyhow, Tom decides to go across the 407, the express toll route. 
that goes above Toronto and then cut down south at the end and uh, go down into uh, down a lake. Their hotel was down Lakeshore on the Lakeshore Road. And uh, so anyhow, we get on this 407 and Tom starts driving like a fucking maniac. Like he, he floored the Suburban and pretty soon he was doing 140 just straight go and then he <laughs> i didn't find out till later that he had asked somebody on the tour if 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 the, if this governor could be defeated and i think they actually defeated it somehow they either pulled a fuse or change the wire or whatever it's all of a sudden this 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 suburban could do every bit of what was on the speedometer so we're going down the 407 and i'm going faster and faster and faster and dave i'm looking at dave and i'm going holy shit i can't even keep up to this guy and by the time i was up to him i was doing about 155 on a highway that was a hundred speed limit. So all of us are doing this, these three vehicles, I think, we were three of us, and we're blowing down this road at 150, 160 kilometers an hour, and all of a sudden we blow by an OPP. All three of us doing the same, the same speed. And so, of course, of course, the lights come on. And I look at Dave and I go, well, that's it. We're dead. We're going to jail. And I immediately slammed on the brakes and uh, pulled over. And, of course, these other two arseholes, Tom and, and Darren and Charlie and the other vehicles, they just kept on going. And then they they saw what happened in their rear views, I suppose. And they, about a kilometer away, they pulled over on the shoulder. So I'm I'm... I'm sitting there and I'm smoking a cigarette and I'm shitting my pants and I roll the window down and this, this really nice looking woman, this OPP officer walks up to the window and goes, do you have any idea how fast you were going back there? And I said, yes, ma'am. I, unfortunately, I do know exactly how fast I was going. And, uh, she said, why are you driving so fast? And I said, well, didn't you see the other two vehicles in front of us? And she said, I, and she didn't really answer me, which kind of pissed me off. I was like, they're sitting right up there. See those two vehicles up there? And uh, she said, yeah, what about them? I said, well, they were doing, that's why I'm driving so fast. And at this point, I, I threw my, I, I put my cigarette and put it out the corner of the window on the ground. She goes, I'm going to fine you for littering. <laughs> and I just looked at Dave. Dave looked at me. He didn't know what to say. She said, get out and pick that up. And I said, I don't think so. And Because it, it was windy. And it blew the butt blew way the hell off in the middle of nowhere. I said, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, I have no, there's no ashtray in this vehicle. And there wasn't. It was a brand new Mazda MPV van. I had just bought for the tour, and it had no, they had no ashtrays. They didn't even have a lighter, I don't think, at that time. So anyhow, that passed by, and she, and she was getting more and more angry, and I said, listen, I said, I, I realize you're gonna, um, that you're going to give me a ticket, but the reason we're going this fast is because you see that black Suburban up there? Stompin' Tom Connors is driving that rig, and we're on tour with him, and it's literally in our contract that we have to keep up with him no matter how fast he's driving. I said, I would never drive this fast, but I have no choice. I have a contract with him, and if I don't keep up with the group, they're going to fire us. So, and she, she just went, she didn't believe us, I don't think. Even though it was obvious that we were telling the truth, well, not obvious, but... There was enough evidence right in front of her that, you know, but she didn't, she, she didn't do anything. So she, she 
She said, you wait here. And I thought, oh God, I'm, I'm going to lose the car. I'm going to, like, I figured she was going to just slay me. And she did, but not as bad as she could have. She come back, gave me a, a 300, I think it was $360 ticket. And, and, and took all my demerit points. So essentially I lost my license on the side of the road. And, uh, I said, well, I said, how the hell am I, how am I supposed to do this? I said, I, this tour is far from over and we can't, we can't lose a driver. What am I supposed to do? And she said, well, I don't care what you do, but pay the fine and, you know, you can go ahead and drive. You get caught with, if you get caught again with this, with a suspended license, you're probably going to go to jail. And I said, oh my God almighty. So I lost my license. She let us go. I started pulling down. The boys see me coming, so they took off. And we finally got to the motel. I walked into Tom's room and I said, I said, man, I just got fucked hard. And he said, what happened? And I said, well, what do you think happened? We're driving 160 kilometers an hour trying to follow you. And I'm the only fucking guy that got stopped by the cops. And I just lost my license and this ticket for whatever it was. A, it was a massive ticket. And he said, bye, don't worry. He says, I'll pay the ticket for you. Give it to whoever. So I gave the ticket to somebody and they did pay it. But it didn't solve my license problem. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that was, a, that was a nightmare. Eventually, I, 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 I drove on that license for the whole rest of the tour. And luckily, it was never stopped again. Then I had to go back and get my, retake my test. And I was threatened by the, by the, examiner and all this other, it was a nightmare when I, I got off that tour and had to go get my license I ended up on a provisional license for a year and uh but that being said I I never got stopped again I'm not really a speeder people think I am as much as I drive but uh the truth of the matter is is I drive so much that I'm scared to be a speeder because I've seen what peop happens to people who, who speed. A lot of them die. So very, very careful out in the road about driving always was. So yeah, that, that was a nightmare and a half. Another good little story from this trip was, had to do with Dave and his, he had kind of one little blow up as well with Tom and, uh, it didn't amount to anything, but it was interesting to see it go down. Um, we arrived in Halifax and we're playing the Rebecca Cohen Auditorium and staying out in Bedford at some little drive up place there. And of course it was, it was as close as we were going to get to, um, well, it was Okay. So at that point, I hadn't, hadn't seen Hilda for weeks and weeks. So she obviously wanted to come to the show and, 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 and spend, spend the night with me in the room because we were leaving again for wherever. And I, it, was, it, was, uh, I'll, it was a bit tense uh, because of the rules. And I said to Tom, Hilda's coming in for the show. And... Uh, I'm, I'm not, she's going to, we're going to go to supper and whatnot. And so he said, you know, I don't like that going out. He said, you got to stay with the band, you know. I said, yeah, I understand. I said, I know, Tom, but I'm just, I just want to go over and have supper across the street with her at this restaurant. You know, it's my wife. I haven't seen her in weeks and we're not doing, you know, we're not, I'm not leaving you. I'm just going to go. And then I and then I had to negotiate getting another room for us because we obviously we weren't going to stay in a room with Dave, so that was a bit tense. Like it was it was it was a bit tense. It was, um, and but he let it happen. But he he basically said to us, 
uh, he said to me, he says, don't let anybody know you got that other room. I don't want anybody to know. You, you just act like everything's hunky-dory. And, uh, you know, when it comes time to go to bed, we'll just, uh, you just go over to the other room there and don't make, don't tell nobody about it. And just, so it was really weird. And Tom and Hilda had a strange relationship because Tom, Tom, you know, used to take the piss out of her all the time. And, uh, cause she, she would run off at the mouth with Tom and Tom would, remember Tom looked at her one time, I think it might even have been on that trip. We ended up in the room with all of us with him at the end of the, after the show. And Tom looked at Hilda and said, you do a lot of talking, but you haven't got a lot to say, do you? And it, and it was just dead silence for 10 seconds and everybody started laughing. But, you know, Hilda, Hilda didn't take that too well, but Tom just didn't suffer fools. So he, when she ran off on something, you know, he would shut her down gently, but, you know, just, and it was like, so that was kind of weird. And then, of course, when we get up to, uh, I'm pretty sure this happened in Picto, right? So there's Dave with his wife and, you know, she's there and, and he, desperately wanted to go just get clean clothes and see his wife, right? And when he went and asked Tom about doing this, Tom kind of shut him down because of the reasoning was was that he was going to spend the night with his wife at his, at home. Different thing to Tom, right? And he wasn't going to let him wasn't going to let Dave do it. And Dave looked at Tom and said said Jesus, boy, he said uh you must have had some terrible people out in the road with you to have the, to have these rules in place, you know. And he said, and he said it in front of a bunch of people that were, you know, a bunch of the crew. And the same thing happened. The two roosters hit each other, and Tom brushed it off. He was pissed, and uh, told Dave, you know. We'll talk about this later. And, of course, he he went to Dave after, you know, by himself and just and told Dave, you know, these rules are in place for a reason. He said, I and, you know, I understand that you need to go home and do this and this, and this is just for the evening, and you live right here. And he said, but there is a reason. And he said, I, I may have had people, you know, unreliable people, and whatnot, and cause problems. He said, and I just want the show to go well, and the tour to go well, and everybody to have fun and have a good time and make some money. And but the rules are there for a reason. He said, and I and I and I trust you. He said, I wouldn't let anybody else really do this. And he and he, and again, he kind of swore Dave to secrecy. Don't tell anybody that you're doing this. You know, just act like you're going back to the room with JP and blah blah blah. And, and so he let Dave go, which was a miracle. Dave went home, washed all his clothes, saw his wife, got up the next morning, snuck back to the hotel, and nobody I don't think any I don't think Darren and Charlie or anybody in the friggin' tour was even the wiser that it even happened. But that was Tom, right? Again, this is this is a working with a guy that's just got a whole other way of doing business because of his own personal history, right? And uh, we ended up, him and Dave and I ended up both confronting him concerning it, right? There's so many more things that happened on the trip, you know. They'll probably start to come up. Like, I, I, I know that there's been so many. This is episode 61 of this series, so it's just like, there's so many, as we move forward through this, uh, Parts of the entire story story may be repeated, or even new things told in a different light. And like, there's just so many things, you know, that I um, all of my entire life is interconnected with my past. There's no matter what happens to me now, or I, that I witness now, it always ties back to something that happened to me. And you know, with with these people who were just like the building blocks of my life and my career. And so uh, one thing I want to hit on really quick too is you couldn't give Tom hard liquor. 
And I remember in PEI, Charlie took a bottle of Crown Royal over to the room and everybody had told, Brian came and told everybody, listen, you know you can drink beer with this man until the cows come home and he's not going to get drunk, which is true. The man could drink 24 beer and be sober as a judge. And uh, he said, but if you give him hard liquor, could end the tour. And it was true. If he drank hard liquor, he got drunk. And then he got belligerent. And then he just didn't give a shit if he played or not. So Charlie, idiot, goes over with a bottle of Crown Royal and gets Tom shit-faced. And doesn't realize the mistake he's made. He doesn't, he doesn't, he, he, and he, that caused a serious problem. There was a huge argument after the fact, you know, and Charlie was like, man, what the fuck are you guys talking about? We're both grown men. If I want to drink hard liquor and he wants to drink it with me, who the hell are you? And blah, blah, blah. And I was really surprised Charlie didn't get fired by Brian, right? Tom wasn't going to fire him because Tom had a great time, <laughs> but it, it was a it was a very narrowly narrowly uh, di averted disaster because Tom did go on a bender for two or three days and we just barely salvaged it. But it, you know, it that was the sort of thing that you uh, you know you had to deal with out there. So I remember we finished the tour in Ontario. It was sort of a zigzag tour. Started in Ontario, went, played all the way out east, and then played all the way back to Ontario. And then I still remember going to say goodbye to Tom. You know, me and Dave went went together to his room. It was a la It was it was over. The last show was done, and we had a party. I think the night. And then the next day, we were, we hung around, and we were leaving that afternoon. And um, we went down to his room and just. It was really kind of touching. It was very moving because all three of us, you know, kind of left the room in tears. It was, it was, it was very moving. It was, we went down there and, and Tom was his usual kind of gruff self and making fun, making fun of us. And he was all smiles and laughing and happy and, and, uh, thanked us profusely for the job we did. And, and, uh, we both we both got a hug. Tom was not a huggy person, but uh, I used to hug him all the time. And he used to tell me to piss off and stop touching him, and I just kept hugging him. And after a while, he started to hug me back a little bit, you know. And uh, we gave him a hug, and we told him we loved him, and we, and and we were kind of teary eyed, and he was teary eyed, and it was just it was a great ending, and it was an ending I was. I was an ending that I, that I, in all honesty, I think the reason I went on the tour in the first place, besides wanting to see Dave in that, in that situation, the real reason I think I actually went on the tour was because I got cheated by myself and, and, and others out of completing the job with him. I saw this as a way to do the whole tour, have a successful trip, and get to have that, you know, go say goodbye, thanks, love you, let's do it again sometime. I was cheated out of that the first time in 1990. I never carried the mail all the way through with Tom, and it really, really bothered me. Because it's something I prided myself on my entire career, is when someone hired me to do something, I did it. And I did it all the way to the very end until it became, if, unless it became completely untenable. I would stay in for years if I had to, to get shit done. And I was never able to give that to Tom or myself. And so the, that tour was one of the most special trips that I ever made. And I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget the people that were around us and the, audiences and the the it brought Dave and I a lot closer I think we really learned we'd known each other a decade at that point but even so we really got a lot closer we wrote songs together we you know I learned a lot about him he learned a lot about me and 
It was just a friggin' brilliant trip, and I wouldn't take a million dollars for it. And uh, obviously, it, it it strengthened my relationship with Tom as well. Tom and I were as close as any two people can get in this business, you know, like, and that was one of the reasons, and I think Tom even knew it. I think Tom knew I went there to, to prove something to myself and to him that I was capable of going out in the road and doing the job for him and doing it well and without any outside influences, get the job completed. That was the biggest thing, was getting the mail, getting the mail carried where it was supposed to go. And Tom let me do that. Dave helped me. And, and yeah, it was a, it was a good time.